bine ați venit la numărul 22. Pentru cei care nu mă cunoaște și nu mă spune o dată, eu sunt Ștefan, organizatorul și hostul vostru. Avem o continuare ca de fiecare dată, deschis Call for Speakers. Dacă sunteți interesați, vă aștept și mai mai drag. Astăzi îl avem pe Mihai. Unii dintre voi îl știu. Dacă nu știți, probabil o să se prezinte. <laughs> Așa. Uh, următorul va fi în septembrie. Următorul evenimentul va fi în septembrie, undeva pe la mijloc. Și cel mai probabil va fi în online. Speakerul care l-am pregătit, din păcate, nu prea poate să ajungă în CV-ul. Și atunci o să transferăm evenimentul în online. Și după aceea vom vedea. Mai avem un speaker program și pentru octombrie. Și tot așa. Acestea fiind spus, eu dau cuvântul meu. So this is going to be L and embracing the functional web. First things first though, I really want to ask you guys, which one of you were, are, or are planning on being JavaScript developers? Raise your hand. Right, so the majority of you. Okay, and here's a question for you. Does this look familiar? So person.stick is not a function. Or you might have seen this undefined as a function, but I'm guessing at least the majority of you have seen this one before. So apparently this person right here cannot speak according to JavaScript. Oh, how about this one? Geometric properties of undefined. Guessing that's a very common error you get in JavaScript. Uh, right. So, and they are playing with a game with a very length for variable modifying and so on and so on and so forth. So why am I mentioning this in a presentation about functional programming? Well, the subject of this presentation is going to be the L programming language, whose very existence is meant to rectify the errors you usually get in regular JavaScript. But I'm also going to touch in stuff you can do in regular JavaScript to kind of be a lot safer. And I'll be making some parallels to React since uh, they tend to do the same thing. And you can have your React applications do something very similar to what Elm does. Let's get the boring stuff out of the way. Hi, I'm Mihai. I work at Nerds. Uh, probably by the fact that I'm holding a presentation of functional, you can kind of guess that I like it. Uh, specifically, I like Elm, that's the subject of today. I also like Elixir, and I also like finding new JavaScript libraries that provide you all that functional goodness in regular, plain or regular JavaScript. One good example is Ramda, uh, so you can Google that later on. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's a very honorable mention. Right, so the $100,000 million question. What is functional programming? Is it like a God-given gift, or is it just, you know, some hippie New Age stuff? The short answer to that is neither. But uh, there are definitely some advantages you can have in functional programming. There are also some disadvantages, but it's, you, know, you cannot learn anything new unless you try it. So, uh, first things first, I want you guys to look at this piece of plastic code and let me know if there's anything wrong you can see here. So this is a normal function, a divide function, that takes two numbers, a and b, and returns another number. Anything looking wrong with that? No, really, it is. And yeah, I mean, if I call divide of 5 and 2, we're going to get 0.5. Makes sense, doesn't it? But what happens if I call divide of 1 and 0? I get infinity. And yeah, that is a number, but it's a very special case number. And just by looking at this function definition, I have no way of telling that this function can return infinity. Let's look at another example. Uh, here's a very another normal function, get element by ID, as an ID, as an array, returns the element of the array that has the data, right? Break your stuff. And once again, get element by ID, one with an array of one and two, that's two, right? But, compared to the data of three, it's one and one. 
So it's the same issue. I'm saying this function definition, but I have no way of telling that it could return an undefined. Now, of course, these are very, very trivial examples, but the same principle applies to very complex functions that you might see in your regular day-to-day -day job. Uh, of course, there are some things you can do. For instance, here you can change the type notation to return number or undefined, and that's probably going to show you that, oh, it can return undefined. But I found that solution to be pretty unsustainable, since when your function grows again, and you might have another special case, you just don't have to update this constantly. And imagine that you're using this function somewhere, and that somewhere has to know what types it can return. So we're be talking about type language here. Uh, and what's going to happen is you're not going to have any statement. And if you use this function in another place, you're going to have another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and so on. So just checking the same thing over and over and over again, right? Right, so, why do I bring that up again? What would functional programming help us with to fix these issues? Wrapping. <laughs> Wrapping those values into something that can tell us more about itself, right? So, for an example, I'm going to create here a type. I'm going to call it maybe. Just thinking it's kind of uh, fitting. Uh, it can be of type t, and it can be i one of two values, right? One of two types, sorry. A just of t or an object, right? Now, of course, I'm going over some implementation practice because TypeScript doesn't really allow you to do that so easily, but let's keep over that. <coughs> I can now update my function here to return maybe of a number, and now I'm doing a check in here. If array of ID exists, I'm going to return just of that value. Otherwise, I'm going to return nothing, right? So what's what difference does it does that make? Uh, this. If I use this function somewhere, which I will eventually do, I can just check whether the element is an instance of just, and I can print it or do whatever it is. Now, the whole difference is that now I'm doing the whole checking inside the low level function, right? And if I have my function grow me, and they can grow a lot, uh, the function that's using it, so like this log element function, will not change. The type in return will be the same, right? So this function only knows that uh, get element by ID can return it just if everything was fine and nothing if something went wrong, right? It doesn't care about what's happening deep down. And short time now, I can, for instance, say, oh, that element has also not been null. And same thing, I can. And now my my function that's using this isn't going to change. It's going to be the same, the same uh, function signature. Nothing changes. Only the the inner function implementation. I can go ballistic here and also inject a function that checks uh, whether the condition is met. And once again, nothing changes. So why do I talk about all this stuff? Because I want to introduce monad, which from now on will be represented through that little Haskell icon there. Now, what a monad is, at its very, very basic, is a wrapper. So the wrapper I was talking about. Uh, they can be a lot more complicated when you go down and dig into them, dig into them, but uh, for the purpose of this presentation, this is all we need to know. Uh, so there are a couple of kind of common monads. One of them is the maybe monad. So yeah, I got the name from somewhere. Uh, which can be, as we saw, just an A for nothing. Another very common monad you might see is an either monad. That would be a left or a right. So you'd be using this to determine your logic flow. So based on some condition, you'd be going on the left branch of the logic or on the right branch of the logic, right? And as I said earlier, they are very, they can be very complicated. I mean, digging around monads can make you feel as if you need like a college semester's worth of math to actually understand what's going on. Once again, for the purpose of this presentation, this is all we need to know. But you can definitely, and should definitely, uh, look at that in the G file. So let's put a pin on that idea. We'll go back to it later on. Uh, another very important concept I really want to introduce here <coughs> is the concept of a pure function. Uh, and of course, since we have a concept of a pure function, there has to be an inner function, right? So what's going on? What's the difference between them? What's so special? What's the whole deal? Uh, 
when you get down to it, a pure function is a function that has an input and gets an output, and nothing else. No magic in between, no go to the database, not making HTTP calls, nothing like that, right? And very importantly, for the same input, it has to always get the same output, right? So a very trivial example would be an add function. You know, if you add one plus two together, it's going to be three all the time, right? So it's a very, it's a very mathematical way of looking at functions, right? And why do you do that? Same thing. Uh, obviously, the function is pure, so if it respects the conditions I said earlier, it's going to be easy to test, right? Because you're sure that your function has no side effects. Uh, for the same input, it's always going to be the same output, so it makes testing those functions a lot easier. Also, they're predictable, right? You knowing what it does and knowing that you won't do any side effects, uh, you can a lot easier determine the behavior it's going to have in relation to the rest of your program or just by itself. And also, it kind of they kind of push you to respect the single responsibility principle a lot more, since there's only so much stuff you can put in the function that only gets an input and returns an output, right? So as I said, you cannot go to the database, you cannot uh, make an API call, so they tend to be a lot simpler. But there's still a question, like, when you think about it, if you were to do that, what are the implications? Well, obviously, a lot more code, and if there's an issue with you, sorry. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot more important stuff here. For instance, when you think about it for a, for a moment, Functions that take in user input are never pure, and they can never be. Like, I have no way of being certain that the keyword the user is using is actually working properly, right? What happens if it's sending wrong signals, or it fails for some reason, on itself, right? I have no way of telling that. And the other side of the coin, output mm -hmm. behaves in the same way. If I were to have a function that logs the stream, right, that can never be pure, since uh, I'm not sure that the monitor the user is using is working properly. Or if we go back to the web, I have no way of knowing that the user's graphics card is unplugged and it renders stuff improperly, right? So, there's the answer right there in the corner. You wrap stuff around, right? So, you create a whole layer around your application, right? And only through that layer, your application communicates with the outside world. That meaning input and output as well, right? And the responsibility of that layer would be to take in whatever it receives, right? For instance, going to the input, and turning that into moments, into specific records that your application knows how to deal with, right? Because in that, in that case, your functions know what moments it can receive, and they know that, for instance, going back to the maybe example, you're going to be a maybe of a value, right? And that no return to just or nothing, right? So that allows you to isolate the dangerous outside world with all its uses and pesky stuff like reality and just create a very mathematical program for you, which tends to fail a lot less than the thing of it, right? So let's put the thing in that idea too. Right, so to the subject of this talk, L is a programming language, uh, which its own website describes as a delightful language for reliable web applications. It's been up since 2012, so that's 10 years now. And in my experience using it, uh, it's very handy for avoiding runtime errors. Uh, its only purpose is to build web apps, so it's very, very focused on that. You won't be able to build backends now. Uh, so I'm guessing the closest equivalent you find that is a JavaScript framework. So for instance, React, Angular, Beaver, and so on. So it has basically, it fills the same niche as those frameworks do. Now, some other things about it. It's a strong data language. So no going around and changing types and size. Also, it lacks an any type, the way TypeScript does. So it won't allow you to cheat. You have to input the correct type all the time and declare your functions with the proper typing. Uh, it has a virtual DOM, the same way React does. So you have virtual DOM in which you 
uh, store stationary components, and only in both updates do you update the actual DOM of the browser. <coughs> and it transports JavaScript, and that's uh, it's building basically JavaScript functions that in the end render HTML, right? So that's the way you integrate it in the browser. Uh, that opens up a lot of possibilities actually, because you can just create small L components and integrate them gradually into large JavaScript code bases, one by one. So if you want to add that shift uh, for projects that are already on, and let's say it's a strong case, uh, you can do it in your mention. So there are some graphs I have here. This is a lack of performance graph that's comparing a couple of popular uh, web development solutions. And as you can see, L is sized uh, in the first place for lack of performance with Svelte and Apra. Uh, and U is an angular like, down there, and Redux is even React and Redux is even lower uh, down the line. And now is another one comparing bundle sizes. So pure angular. <laughs> uh, and also L is not on the top here but it's really close to the top, and it's over the most popular web frameworks that are currently in use. And there's another one uh, preparing to line of code in which it kind of sucks, to be honest. You have to write a lot more code in L, but uh, if I were to, to be subjective for a moment, I think that this is not a disadvantage compared to the other advantages we get. Uh, right, so, by the way, those graphs were taken from the real world uh, repo, which is like a very common repo in which a lot of different frameworks and languages implement the same application, which is a medium flow, and that's being used as a benchmark for the tests, right? So we're not talking about a to-do app, we're talking about a rather complex app, right? What makes L special, though, is this. This is the L architecture. So there are four um, that you have to be aware of working with L, and those are the update, mobile, view, and connect And we'll be going through each and every one of them now. <coughs> I'd say the easiest of them is the model. What it is, is basically a state. So it's just the state of your component or application or whatever. So it's pretty dumb, something like this. Uh, what's rather special about it is that it's by default immutable, and every single thing in L is immutable by default. You cannot change it once it's on. Can create all new ones. So whenever you have to update the state, you're not actually changing the existing state. You're creating new states based on the old values. But that's the model that I'm dusted for. Next, we'll probably need a view. Now what the view does is it's taking uh, L code and turning it into JavaScript and then in the end into HTML. So this would be the actual components you'd be writing, right? It's going to be your days, your endpoints, your whatnot. What's important though is that all your functions have to be immutable. As I said, everything is immutable in L and also pure. So your view function will not be able to do anything else than rendering HTML, right? That's it. So there's a view. Now the messages are what they think is the juiciest thing about L. So what messages are, they're sort of actions, if you guys have used Redux before, that concept should be familiar to you. And they look kind of like this, so it's basically in our type, which uh, can be very uh, a lot of different alternatives of. So you get like, get more posts, get more respondents, create friendship and stuff, right? And uh, whenever you actually do something in your HTML, so let's say you click a button, or you change an input, or whatnot, uh, it's going to <coughs> emit one of these messages right here. Which, by the way, can have a value there. I wonder if that sounds familiar. So that's the messages. Now, the update function. <coughs> um, this is very similar to the reducer uh, function in Redux. So, what it does? Plain function, which has to be pure again. It's going to take the message that was dispatched. So whenever you emit a message, whenever you click a button or change an input or whatever, it's going to emit a message and trigger the update function. It will take the current state, the current model, 
sort of yeah, and that has to be a model that makes sense. And this will take the current model of your application, right? And based on these two, it will produce a new model, right? So as I said, it being pure for the same message and the same model, it will always have the same resulting model, right? So it's a lot more deterministic. So that's the update. So I guess this is uh, a beginning in the architecture. So it's a small recap. You have your model, you have your view. The view has the model as its parameter. <coughs> Whenever something changes in the view, you click a button or whatever, it is going to emit a message. Emitting a message will trigger the update function, which based on that message and the previous model will produce a new model. And a new model will re-render your view. So this very circular structure, which once again is very, very similar to using React and React. I'm making that analogy constantly because that's the way I learned that. But that still leaves us with a couple of questions, right? I mean, how do I decide that? If all my functions are pure and I cannot do HTTP calls or anything like that, I mean, I'm in the web, I have to do that. So I don't do it. I don't do it. Also, it might be useful to access the browser sometimes. Like, a uh, very common example is writing to the local storage. In ALS, you cannot do that uh, natively, you have to access the JS code. And also, uh, ALM is interoperable with JS since you know, it's transpiles to JS. So it has to somehow work with it, right? Also, <coughs> I said those functions have to be pure, right? How do you get the current time? I mean, if you have that regular JavaScript date or not, you know, pulling that multiple times, we get you know, the results are never the same one. So that is like, it just cannot be done, right? And of course it can. We'll get it. And another issue is randomness, because, you know, by its very nature, randomness is meant to, you know, provide you with a value you cannot know in advance. So that's kind of counter to, to how you would write your functions. Let's talk about commands and subscriptions, usually uh, abbreviated to CMD and sub. What a command is, it's a concept in Elm which allows you to do the side effects I was talking about. And it all ties in with the update function. So we know already that the update function will provide us with a new model, right? So an action was emitted, uh, yeah, an action was emitted. The update function was called, and based on the previous model, it will produce a new model, right? But it can also produce the supples, that would be like a two-elemental range JavaScript, uh, having the new model and the command. Now, what that command will do is, it's going to talk with the Elm runtime, basically. So that is the, the application wrapper I was talking about earlier in Elm's at the system. And that uh, application layer can do a lot of stuff. It can do HTTP calls. It can do, you know, getting the current time, as I said. It can talk to JavaScript using something called ports, look at backlit. And then, after that, it has to return another message, which, once again, should be the update function. So, you have a new message that will modify your model with the results from those, uh, should I say, unsafe things. And <coughs> The a very very nice thing about Elm is since you're getting those unpure functions through the Elm runtime, uh, it will coalesce them to monads we already know. So, for instance, in the HTTP call example, we might have an HTTP response, shall I say, which can be one of two types: adjust, let's say, which has like, okay, everything was working, here's your result, or an error, right? And that error can be of multiple reasons, right? It can be a not found, it can be a bad request, it can be like internal server error, right? And what is cool about it is that you're not allowed to get the inner value of those wrappers unless you treat each and every one of these things, right? It's forcing you to. You have an option of doing like a generic other, but it's forcing you to do it nonetheless. So in the example of the HTTP call I was talking about earlier, you could, if you're lazy, just have on the just, you know, push the data to the model, and on everything else, don't change anything, right? But the important thing is it forces you to do that if you want to get your value, so you won't be having a runtime error because of an HTTP call which has failed, right? You have to at least 
entertain the thought that it can fail, right? So it's kind of tying, so it's kind of, you know, uh, pulling the rug right and from under your optimism, like the way we kind of write code most of the time, is not letting you do that. And the compiler is very strict, so you have to play by the rules, otherwise it's going to complain a lot. So, uh, there is a sign out about the port I was talking about earlier. Ports are another uh, concept that allows allow you to actually communicate with JavaScript. And what they are basically are plain old JavaScript subscriptions, right? So you're declaring a port. In your JavaScript code, uh, which you're going to have to because you have to do a whole element, uh, you create a subscription that's listening to that port. And whenever you push a command through that port, because commands get to, to JavaScript through ports, uh, it's going to trigger the subscription, and you're going to be able to you know, do your JavaScript stuff, like write into the local storage that I said earlier, right? And they are also very, very useful in the subscriptions I was looking for. Because commands can allow you to trigger stuff from L, but sometimes you have to respond to stuff that's been uh, coming from the outside of your application, right? So let's think of an example. Let's say I have one component that is writing to local storage, and if a certain value is inserted there, I want another one to do something, right? Now, going the other way around from JavaScript is done for subscriptions, and specifically to those JavaScript subscriptions as we know it's the same term for both L and JavaScript, but it's going to make sense. Uh, so, a JavaScript subscription will be triggered, right? It will push stuff to a subscription in L, right? because L will uh, kind of expose its subscriptions to JavaScript. And when that happens, the L subscription will be triggered, and it will create another message, which by now I'm guessing we know what it's going to do, right? The message from the subscription is being pushed, triggers update function, and the whole model is being rebuilt with the value that was you know, gotten from the subscription. So let's recap for a moment. Uh, monads are cool, pure functions are cool, and it's cool, right? Uh, so I'm guessing now is probably the time that I talk about the cons of using L, because I started praising it for like the whole time now. Um, there are a couple of issues. First, if you're not already used to it, or at least the concept that it's using. So the whole architecture from earlier, or the concept of a pure function or a monad, it can be really difficult to learn. It. <clears throat> I mean, specifically, if you're coming from like a very imperative programming paradigm, like if you were to write, I don't know, old uh, MVC applications, it can be very difficult for you to get a grasp of it. <clears throat> so I would argue that when you do, uh, you're going to get used to it pretty quickly, right? Also, um, I would say that it can, the compiler can be difficult sometimes. And what I mean by difficult is overly strict. Uh, which is honestly a good thing, but some people might find it as a nuisance, right? It forces you to play by rules, and that can be annoying when you're you know, in that crunch and you just have to push stuff through the gate really quickly. But they're doing that with a specific purpose in mind, right? The purpose of you writing <coughs> safer code. Uh, and a con of it, which I have really no answer for, is it's still a small ecosystem. I mean, it has definitely grown a lot in the last 10 years, but it's like nowhere near JavaScript or like even Ruby, where it's a lot more popular than it. And also, <coughs> um, it's not a very what do I put this? It's not very, I'm going to say, cross domain knowledge to have. Like, if you were to learn L, it's not going to help you in the backend. Right? You cannot write backends in L. Whereas, if you were to use you know, JavaScript, which is its own programming language, learning that can make it a lot easier for you to transition to the backend or to any other area, right? So, I'm guessing that is really a con. Also, knowing the Swiss port, I mean, there are a couple of companies that are using it. I've read of a particular company called NoRedInk, which uh, they're doing like online writing courses, and they've switched 
to L. And from what I read, uh, they were making like benchmarks for like six years, and their legacy JavaScript code had like six hundred thousand or something uh, uh, runtime errors, whereas their L errors on the graph I took them was, but I couldn't find it again. I saw it once, but I couldn't find it again. Uh, it was like so many that you can barely say it. <clears throat> because once again, it's forcing you to treat failure, right? It's not letting you ignore it. But uh, they're a very, very small company compared to the, you know, big industry people. So, yeah, you're probably not going to get a lot of support. Uh, you have some plugins for your IDEs, but they're definitely community, so, you know, expect a little less, uh, you know, quality to them. Also, you can find, like, uh, uh, stuff online. There's a lot of stuff online actually, but specifically when you get to to um, certain niche issues, you can find it very hard to, to get around them, right? Or if it's like a very, very, <coughs> shall I say, beginner thing, but you're like me and like bashing your head against the wall instead of reading the whole documentation first, it's going to be a lot harder for you to find what's wrong uh, as opposed to like uh, you know, more popular alternatives. But, once again, when you get the hand, when you get the hand it, in my opinion, it's not easy. So, that would be it for the theory and stuff. Uh, I actually have a demo ready for you as well. And that demo is going to be a e an e-commerce app which uses the, the backend that Rado was presenting last time. So it's called Fruit Commerce. It's a really like you know regular e-commerce application, so we can have our products here. Uh, the images just are randomly selected, so yeah, it sounds really good. And uh, when we go to on them, we can edit the pack and it's gonna create an order. And we have here an alert which had to be triggered through one of the ports I was talking about earlier. So basically me clicking this created a command. That command <coughs> did the HTTP call, right? A graphical annotation in this case. Uh, that command in the end produced another message which updated my state again, right? And then I could trigger the command that um, <coughs> triggered that specific alert, right? Because, you know, regular JavaScript that can provide alerts here only in the browser. I know it sounds complicated, but what's helpful helpful with it is that it forced me to do stuff by the book, right? You couldn't skip steps, even though I might have wanted to somehow. <coughs> cool, so we've got our borders here, and there are a lot of them, because I didn't hear the API. So if you go through an order here, we have like details about it. And we can like create a payment here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, one, two, three, there we go. It's not 16, is it? Yeah. Okay, back. And it was working, and now I'm gonna have a thing here. So, you know, that's very, very regular stuff. You can only style and edit and so on so much. But what happens when, if you remember from last time, there were a couple of different microservices, right? So, there was one microservice for Artemis that was handling the product, another one called Melissa, that was handling the orders, and a third one called Evander, handling the payments. <clears throat> now, what's going to happen if I turn off one of those microservices? So I have like this hash here, and I can stop, uh, for instance, let's stop, let's stop Artemis. So that would be the products service, right? Ah, yeah. It's called Sorry, I couldn't remember the name of the container there. And run something, and I hope it's not gonna force me to awkwardly just talk continuously over waiting for the table. <laughs> cool. Now, if we go to the product page here, probably just cached, if I just refresh it, we will get the loading, because it's gonna time out eventually, and it's a time out of 5 seconds. And oops, something went wrong. <coughs> Now, the thing is, you would obviously create a loading state or an error state in most applications, right? But the thing is, I'm almost forcing it 
nonetheless, right? Even though this is a demo, so not a live application, it forcing me to handle this kind of if, for instance, I was to continue and launch the commerce, right? I would have a stable base, so I wouldn't have to rewrite that much because I already have those tests and specific errors handled. And now, uh, if you go to the orders here, we can see that the orders are still coming. Data from the products are not, right? So the image and the name of the product aren't coming anymore because the service is done. And once again, it was forcing me to handle the fact that they could be coming sometimes, right? So I had to actually write an able product and a default image, once again, forced it. <clears throat> if I go here, uh, you can see the details of the order once again coming in, so everything is working properly there. It's just the product stuff, so the name and the preview that are not coming anymore, right? And again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Should be three of them here. <clears throat> I can do that. It's a failure. So let's try something else. Let's try to stop the vendor too. That would be the service that's handling the payments. Uh, any moment now, it should be stopping. I don't think. <clears throat> now, if I go to pay again, I'm doing another mutation here, and the call is happening in the background, right? Uh, I did that, I didn't do anything with my stand, right? I just figured a command. And as you can see, we have a server, server timeout here. Uh, <clears throat> because I was forced once again to handle that error, right? Otherwise, if I were just to go with the happy flow and just, you know, go with it and my server would randomly crash on me, I would have had a very, very bad day. But now I can keep working around. I mean, the orders are still coming, so I can, you know, look at the big red thing. <laughs> and of course, I think uh, this is cached again. Once again, it will be loading, and the query will eventually turn out. Nothing's there, right? But the important thing is that even though some parts of your application might be failing, the rest is working, right? No matter what happens in the backend, our front end is working. That's important. Because if the user was to see this, it's a lot better than seeing, you know, nothing because your runtime JavaScript failed. Right, so I'm guessing that would be it. I'm gonna just have this touch again. And I'm waiting for questions. Can you do that questions? Mm -hmm. Can you show us some code? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything we can. Uh, everything here is up on the fruit commerce GitHub organization. So let me quickly go there. <clears throat> so the same place where a lot of stuff is, there's a web video here, which I will eventually document properly. But what the code looks like, uh, okay, so for this specific uh, application, I did some custom configuration. What I did was <coughs> adding uh, tailing with CSS for styling, and I also com uh, configured it to render my SCSS, because I want to do custom styling in SCSS. And I'm using uh, Parcel as a bundler, uh, as opposed to Webpack, since it already had like some really easy to configure stuff for Elm and everything else I want to do. <clears throat> uh, so if you go here, let's say, by the way, this was auto-generated already. There's a, for this specific Elm framework I'm using called Elm Spa, there are a lot of um, configurations you can do on its own, so I have a lot less code to write on my own, which admittedly is still a lot. Like this app here, so that folder is going to have like most of the stuff here. So he, here is a very, I'd say, well extracted new function. This will eventually go to the view function because you can build the content code, right? I mean, in the view function, you can call other functions, obviously. And this, somewhere up the chain, is being called into a view. <coughs> the view is specifically for the home page. Uh, but it can get updated, uh, and I think I know exactly where. Uh, should be the pages here, which in this specific case uh, dictates my routing. So the home page is going to be the home page, 
orders, it's going to be slash orders, and these ones are going to be the you know, slash ID. This one's kind of bad. I'm not going to lie to you, this one's kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. this one was German? No, this one was written by me. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, there were some things, since most of the UI I just copied from Tailwind UI, which is like a uh, something that provides a lot of like free components already, like looking good and things. So, okay. Yeah. And there was HTML, right? And there is, I found a website that was just converting HTML to L functions for me, <laughs> like just like that. So I just pasted the HTML there and copied the L function here with all the classes and everything like that. But so uh, one more one question here. So can you show us the uh, the model the message? Yeah, that's the, the syntax. This is specifically why I'm yeah. here, because okay. it has like everything in one place. <laughs> <laughs> so, for instance, this is the update function, right? Which is admittedly very, very big. Uh, first, understand it, here are the messages we can have here, right? So I can. Uh, this is the order ID page. So, this is where I'd be paying for stuff, right? So, obviously, I can I have a change card number, change card mm -hmm. speed, so whenever the value of an input field changes. Uh, these specific messages are being given out, right? And then they're being handled by the update function, which will you know, add the new value to the model. This is how you update an existing variable. Update is a very big word. It's just creating a new one. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a syntax issue. And also, uh, command down here means no command. So this one will not trigger any data. But I also have a create payment message here, which is going to be triggered when I click the pay button. And what it does is it returns the same, same model, right? It's not changing one at all. But instead, it's triggering a command here. So it's a send request function, which is somewhere around here. Uh, I think it's not the this all And maybe plus. So this one is actually creating the mutation, so the graphical mutation. Uh, it's sending this to this URL, it's putting a timeout, and then on the result, it's going to issue a payment created message, right? Which is here, as a response. Now, that payment created one is the practice of subject, <laughs> but this is where the meat and potatoes of it are like, really fleshed out. <coughs> since on success, uh, I'm just you know, updating the stats and then displaying the notification there. So the alert that was there. And also, I can leave a hack here and through a port, I'm updating the shared state of the application uh, just because it was really late when I was doing this and I don't want to do it any better. So that's a quick hack. And also, you can see here I have a command batch because I can emit a lot of commands at once right, from the same. Uh, from the same message. Uh, this is the other case I was talking about because the response here can be a failure, can be a success, can be a what send that in this call and a loading, right? So like basically your the states, the possible states of your request, right? And since in this mutation I'm not specifically planning on doing anything with the loading and not send states, I just return the same model for them. But once again I'm forced to handle them. So I have to at the very least, at this, right? So we won't have any current errors. Good. And one more question here. Sure. Like, what happens if I delete the line where, I don't know, the, the one that's called bad payload? Uh, the M language? This one, right? Yeah. It the, won't compile. It won't compile. It won't compile. Okay, so you need to write every time all the. Um, unless you do this. Ah, okay. <laughs> but okay. once again, it's forcing me to do it on the message, you know? Yeah. I want to have like several messages specific for the errors, specifically for bad errors. <coughs> you know, I could definitely, if I didn't care to inform the user of what error happened, I could have done this for oh. all the errors, right? But once again, it has to do at least that. Yeah. It's not it's untreated. Just... So yeah, this would be another function. And the model is somewhere where oh yeah, there's also a new function, uh, which you know just initializes the model. So you know, not a very fancy thing there. So this is how my state looks 
like for this component specifically, all right? So this would be an example of L code here. <laughs> an overly complex one. <laughs> Right, any more questions? Yeah, we have a couple of questions from the live stream. Sure. So, any thoughts on a closure script? I haven't tried it myself. Uh, personally, I don't really like the syntax of it, since it's been inspired from this, and I really don't like those parentheses. But I do know that the other alternative you can do fully functional using only client-side code, right? Because the other solutions for fully functional programming languages like using uh, things in Elixir, or I've, I've read there's a Fable compiler, yeah, it's a compiler for Fable for Fshop. Those are going to be service side rendered. If you want to do client side, you have to use ClojureScript or L, yeah, but I haven't used ClojureScript myself. Okay. And we have another one. Do you need something like Redux in React for handling complex state management? <laughs> That's going to be subjective, but I would argue yes. Specifically because using Redux you can have this specific architecture implemented in React, right? Even though you will not have the same uh, type safety, for example, you can have the whole, you know, update view uh, structure and model is going to be the state, right? Uh, you can definitely use Redux for all your components and mimic this architecture in React, which I find to be, you know, treating failures first. I mean, this is going to that's going to get rid of a lot of runtime errors and no one wants that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Do we have uh, libraries of frameworks like Bootstrap where we can yes. easily <coughs> style your code? For instance, here I'm using Devlin. Okay. But you also have stuff for Bootstrap, you also have stuff for Material. Oh. So you have most of it there. Uh, styling itself can be done in Elm, so fully within Elm, in multiple ways. Uh, there's a library called Elm UI which tries to get different systems together. So you can just provide attributes all in Elm. There's also an Elm CSS library that kind of just translates CSS to Elm functions, but definitely has support from Bootstrap, Material, Elm, stuff like that. Uh, you said for like many JavaScript errors are impossible. So uh, a little bit louder. Okay. Yeah, you, <laughs> you said before <coughs> that yeah. many JavaScript errors are composed of those no reference errors or yeah. unfine. Yeah. Uh, do you have a place here in in, in the app uh, where you're trying to access some inner properties of Node? Mm, yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm wondering if you have to wrap any inner property into a main Well, problem. since it's a strongly typed language, you know, if you're trying to access something that's not already declared on the type there, it will fail, right? Yeah, but what if, what if it has a null value or... Something? You don't have any concept of null here. So there's no... What, what, if, what if the response come, comes with a null? You can only have like nothing, right? Uh, for the response itself, it definitely depends on the way you handle it specifically. Like, I can show you an example, I think, for the GraphQL stuff, okay. right? So, there are these folders here. So, Artemis folder is specifically for the GraphQL. And by the way, they were, <laughs> again, auto-generated by the client, by the CLI, since the library I'm using basically makes a request to get the schema and then builds L files based on that scheme. So I just use holy L files declared here. Um, but if I go to let me think of something very ah yeah, so that's been shared and let's look at the order of the up here. So what happens here is um, it's not really a good example since these are long little ties on the scheme itself and won't allow me to do something here. <laughs> But from what I've read, if there's a nullable type, it forces you to use a maybe there. Alright, that's perfect. Man. So you have to use the unwrapping for absolutely in your password. Whenever there's something that's like not necessarily there, uh, you have to use that. I actually have an example of the recourse for optional parameters, right? 
uh, if you want to do the parameters, you have to use wrappers. So you have like a present wrapper, which is going to be like the opposite of a just. You wrap the value here, which is 100, into a present, right? And if you just don't want to provide it, you have to uh, use this absent type, right? But you have to provide everything. You have to provide the whole interface there so that you respect the actual contract, right? Hope that answers the question. <laughs> but another thing that's like really cool, I think, here is that looking at the way these functions work, I can actually see the structure of my response since I had to create a connection selection, which is basically, you know, the GraphQL thing of doing, you know, inner stuff. Let's call the selection here. So I have to get the connection from the response, I have to get the edge array from that connection, and in edges I have a node. So each edge has a node, I have to declare that too. And I have to declare it like this, in which, for instance, in the edge, I say, oh, this will have an edge, a uh, node, sorry. And how I will I resolve that node to an L value, a proper L value, using this other function here, which is gonna take the node and resolve the ID, the product ID, quantity and stuff. So I have to resolve all the types, right? And specifically the types I declare in this one. So this would be the equivalent Elm type I'd be using. So for instance, if I have a graphical query in which I don't want to get certain fields, which is like power graphical, I just have to remove this one from here. And I'll get it. Right? And this is generated? Uh, no, this one is actually written by me. Okay. But all the imports here, like the object itself, the structure of it, was generated, right? So the actual, uh, for instance, root query, the representation, the types that were declared in the schema were generated. But this one is like very generic. Like you do this for basically just the same. And I would have possibly just made it a lot like smarter. Like you had a way of doing like uh, ge generics in L, like provide a type, like generic type, and then use it. Uh, what am I doing that here? Actually, I think I have an example of that as well. And that would be, let me remember it quick. Yeah, yeah. So this would be like the shared stuff in my application, right? So I am creating a feature, I'm calling it, which is gonna serve as the structure for every single one of my features. So that would be the payments, the orders, and the products, right? And for each and one of them, each and every one of them, I have a status and a list. And as you can see, the status here is declared the connection as a type, right? And the list is of type entity, so this would be generic types. And then whenever I actually use them, I have to provide the actual types. So it would be feature of product and product connection, feature of order and order connection, and so on and so forth. Right? So you can definitely do some smart things here. So if... <laughs> I don't know which one. Which one? <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Uh, okay. uh, you're going to hate me probably for this question, but... No, go ahead. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> do, they, do they have a way to throw exceptions? No. Ah, they yeah. don't. <laughs> <laughs> they won't allow it, it just won't comply. That's perfect. Yeah, like, what happens if you have, like, 100 models? So you have to declare them here? Uh, structure is recursive, right? So, for instance, each and every one of the, uh, the components that you're using have their own models, right? So you have what you need in just that component, you know, just that. And what you need to be shared, specifically shared, you will declare in the shared state here, the way I did it. So this is just my implementation. It allows you to do it in many other ways, right? Yeah. It supports something like um, omit or pick, right? Or it supports some um, um, omit. Or uh, omitting pick. No. no. No, it's for CDG, it's not. I mean, if you want to omit them, I guess you can do maybe, right? And just provide an nothing there, if you really want to omit it. But you have to let it know that this can be omitted sometimes, you know? And do they have a strong support for models? I mean, which models are you 
Uh, the one I've been using mostly are uh, maybe an Eva, and of course you can declare like you know your own stuff. And I've seen some libraries that do provide uh, some extra stuff, and you have operators for the like, function composition stuff like that. But you won't have the whole thing you have in Haskell, and that's because it's Elm is really trying to be a small language, right? It's not trying to bring the complexity that so the one of us that have been looking to Haskell know it inherently has. Right? They're trying to make it easy on developers to you know, adopt it. So that's kind of, they're not so pure as Haskell is. How easy is to debug? Sorry? How easy is to debug? And uh, that's the thing, because you won't be really doing so much debugging. Okay. Uh, the, comp the, the, compiler, <laughs> the compiler actually provides a lot of really, really uh, helpful errors. Like, for instance, uh, let's say I have a person and I have a phone number there, right? And using summer, I just type in phone n number instead of phone number, right? Instead of just looking at undefined, you know, as you would do in JavaScript, the compiler would be like, oh, I think you misspelled something here. Here are the ones that actually look the most like the stuff you write here, right? So the compiler is actually driving you so much towards the error that some people have actually called it compiler-driven development, in which you just write stuff, it's not gonna work and just you know fix the errors one by one. <laughs> kind of like DDD but it's a compiler. It's so strict that it can actually allow you to do it. Because if you can get it to compile, 99% of the time it's gonna work, right? Unless of course you can break it. Like if you do like infinite recursion recursion that's a new. Or if you use too much JavaScript control. So like if you use the commands that's looking about earlier. And just write like the whole logic of revolution in JavaScript, of course it can fail, right? Because it doesn't have the same uh, safety. And um, has some guards against it because you have to provide a message when it comes out of it. But there's so much you can do, you know? So it's basically a very good practice to avoid using JavaScript as much as possible and do as much stuff in Elm as you can. And I, I assume in those forms you were talking about while. Uh, using JavaScript code inside of that. Yeah. Uh, I think if that, that fails, probably yeah. it will just not trigger. It will just, it will just not trigger the, the that comment. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, right. Exactly. But the code won't won't like fail. Exactly. Exactly. This is a good part of it. Uh, here's an example actually the command that's triggering the alert there. Right. So this is basically the JS function that's just imported into my index.html. And it initializes the Elm app, and then it just uh, have subscription here, here for the display notification port. And this is exactly the same name that it has in Elm, right? So that's the only thing you have to tie that. Declare a port with this name, and then subscribe to it on the ports field here, right? And whenever I push uh, that command with the message, it's gonna, you know, we know alert that message, right? And here happens like the whole shebang in which I have a command here for a port, and then for a subscription, <coughs> I'm actually sending data from JavaScript to Elm, right? So the other way around. And in, on the Elm side, you have probably to convert the data to a mobile, right? So Sorry? On the Elm side, when this data arrives on the Elm, on the Elm side, you'll have probably to uh, uh, convert it to an object. I have to declare the command and the descriptions with a message when I declare it, right? So I you have to return a message. And you also configure the type of that message, right? Sorry? You also have to set up the type of that message, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah, you do. You, do. you have yeah. to specify each field you, you're expecting, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, if you're drawing a lot of stuff in JavaScript, it's going to probably be an issue, nonetheless, like, you know. Yeah, and and all the other stuff, let's say, if I just want two fields, but like JavaScript sends me thousands. Well, will the other ones be just ignored? Ignored? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. ignored. Well, I have a million dollar question. Please. Have you used this on production? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's uh, related to the cons section I was talking about earlier. It's compared to the other programming language, it's kind of young. I think it's only 10 years old, which in programming language standard is pretty young. And since it doesn't have corporate backing, it's kind of difficult to adopt it. And also, 
if you're like subscribed to the changes in functional stuff in the whole community, you know there's a problem with the adoption regardless. Because people already used to doing the <coughs> stuff in OP, and this changes your way of thinking a lot compared to OP, so it's kind of hard to adopt it, right? But to be nice to you, actually. <laughs> but I do think it's production of the way So it has basically whatever we need for production, right? And there are companies that I said that are using it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, and how does it scale? Sorry? How does it scale? Well, basically, since it just goes into JavaScript in the end, it's the same thing yeah. as you do with JavaScript. Yeah. Right. So it's not anything special mm. about that. OK. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, thank you for having me here.